Okay. Um, hi. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Um, waiting to see if we get some questions from students today. So um, I had been planning on going over the uh, next assignment um, on the sorting function. Um, I had one or two things I kind of wanted to mention about the previous assignment to wrap it up here. I'll probably start with that. So, um, so yeah, if you're watching this video after the fact, I mean, I encourage you, the next two weeks are pretty important um, as far as this class goes. So, I mean, this, this class, you know, we're, we're, our goal is to learn about data structures, but it's also to understand this concept uh, known as the, um, the, you know, how to estimate algorithmic complexity so that you can compare different algorithms. So we're kind of beginning uh, uh, looking at that this week, um, algorithmic complexity by looking at some particular algorithms, some searching and sorting algorithms, um, and then we'll introduce you to sort of this concept of how you can um, analyze um, algorithms like these for um, their behavior in terms of the input size. So that, that's how we normally do algorithmic complexity, right? Um, so with that said, um, I encourage you, um, if you can, I mean, you know, use the videos that I've given for the course. Uh, but I have been recommending um, some, um, some additional videos um, that might be helpful to a lot of people. Uh, from the same people, this mycodeschool.org. I had an announcement about these. So this week, uh, they have a bunch on search um, and the bubble sort and the selection and insertion sort um, that we all look at. Oh, and also kind of as a hit, there's a, um, a video on the quick sort, which is the assignment, you know, so, so you might find those useful um, to try and watch through those as, or in addition to kind of looking at our, at our lecture videos, right? Um, and likewise, though, next week, when we, when we specifically get down to talking about uh, algorithmic analysis, um, you know, I, I really encourage you to try and spend some time and get some extra material, make certain that you understand at least the basics uh, of the, the things that we're going over here. And again, there's some pretty good, they're all rather short uh, videos, so you can watch my videos, um, but you can maybe get some supplementary um, perspectives. Uh, from from this uh, mycode.org uh, uh, um, um, video lecture series, okay? Um, all right. So I'm just going to um, start by covering a few things about the previous assignment. Uh, just talk a little bit about this. So, um, so in, in assignment four, to remind you the assignment was to write some recursive functions, okay? So as I kind of warned about, uh, even though some people still didn't do it, um, I mean, you had to write the both of the recursive functions using recursion, right? Um, and especially the, the second function, um, um, let me go and bring up the, the example solution here. So um, let's get the code here. But um, so I did post some example solutions. I, you know, um, I encourage you to always go back and kind of compare uh, your own work to the example solutions. Let's get the tests here and the header file and um, the uh, implementation file here. So, so anyway, um, I mean, you know, it was incorrect if you weren't using iteration for the iterative version or, or the the, using the formula to do the count combinations directly, right? And it was uh, incorrect not to use recursion for the recursive versions, okay? So the, the re recursive factorial um, is, is relatively straightforward. Um, um, oh, and, and I encourage you, you know, we, we talked about this in our lecture videos, uh, but kind of the secret to writing recursive functions is to be clear about your base case and your general case. And, and whenever I'm writing a recursive function, I almost always, you know, um, at least these aren't really great comments, but um, I almost always uh, at least explicitly specify what is the base case portion in my recursive function and what is the, um, the, the general case, right? And that can be more than one base cases, it can be more than one general case, but, all right. So, um, Factorial, the recursive version of factorial is an example again of tail recursion that we talked a little bit about last week um, in our help sessions, right? Um, 
And um, so, I mean, a recursive function means that you call the function, the function itself inside of the function, okay? So, so the other thing, I don't know if this was a misunderstanding or not, so some people didn't write a recursive version of count combinations recursive. Uh, they, you, some people just use factorial iterative here, and then, then they basically just copied the same code, however you implemented count combinations directly using the formula, but just used the, the factorial recursive, right? So I don't know if, if, if it was a case of misunderstanding or a case of not really being able to figure out how to correctly write recursion. So trying to get away with just using uh, the, the recursive factorial, but you know, using another function that's recursive doesn't mean that the function that you're writing is recursive, okay, if, if that makes sense. So in this case, again, for, for combinations to be recursive, you have to call the same function itself within there, right? So in our case, the base case was uh, a little bit better of a comment on my part here. So our base case is if you're choosing zero or you're choosing, you know, for, from a set of n items, you're choosing all the items, there's only one way to do that. So that's, that's our direct solution whenever you ask for zero or um, all the items. There's just one way of choosing um, all the items or none of the items. Right? And then the general case though, again this was given to you in the assignment description, um, you have to make two recursive calls. So in both of these calls are making the problem a little bit smaller. So, so we, if we know the answer to, to how, how many combinations there are for, in, for a, a set, a one, a one size smaller set where we select one number of items less, right? So that's what we're doing here. And if we add that to um, the, the count the combinations for a set with one less item, uh, but, but where we select the same number of items from that set, right? So if we know the answer to the two of those, if we add that up, that's the answer to the original question of, of in choose I. Um, so again, I, I encourage you, another thing that I showed in the help sessions last week um, is to, you know, use your debugger. So for example, let's try, um, so, so in this, oops, in this case, uh, on the, the object file, um, let's say you wanted to debug um, the count combinations recursive, um, you know, that you were having problems with. Let me just pick one of the tests here. So, um, so we're expecting, I'm, I'm gonna pick a kind of complex one because so, there's another thing that I wanna kind of show. So, you know, we're, we're expecting count combinations recursive to um, six items choose three to return 20. So there should be 20 different ways of choosing three items from a set of six here, right? So if I wanted to um, debug that, you know, I, I could add, um, the code in here. So let's uh, let's get rid of calling the factorial iterative, and let's um, say the result is that. Um, so the result of six choose three is our result. Okay. So from that, now we've got that in here, we should be able to build, and it should only rebuild my main function, I hope. We'll get our debug execute goal, and then we should be able to run it um, in debug mode. So um, let's go ahead and start the debugger. So if you want to, you can just go over here um, and um, launch. I still got that ad hoc like I showed last week, but here we're, we're using uh, just a regular assignment. So the, the launch, the original one that I had for you guys should work on that if we select it and then run. And by default, it should stop um, at the very first statement in there so we can step through things, right? So, uh, so again, I'm in, in, in the debugger here. We can step over. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and step into that. Actually, let's go ahead, I'm gonna make, um, just to illustrate this. So, you know, if you wanna better understand recursion, uh, we can maybe put a breakpoint only when we hit the base case. Now, if I continue, you know, it's going to call six, choose three, which is going to make some re recursive calls. So it'll first try, uh, as we've learned, it'll do the last one first, probably. So it'll, it'll try five, choose three, four, choose three, uh, 
uh, three choose three, two choose three, one choose three, right? So none of those are going to hit base cases until they get to um, uh, the, the um, oh no, when it gets down to three choose three, that's that's our first base case that we hit, we'll hit, right? Um, so anyway, um, if we continue on with the breakpoint here, we'll see when it when it hits um, our breakpoint. Oops, um, did that wrong. I, I must have. Um, uh, we didn't seem to hit the breakpoint there, so I'm going to try it again. So let's uh, run the debugger. Um, Okay, we're back in here. So let's just continue. Oh, well, maybe um, uh, maybe we've got optimizations turned on, so it's um, not um, actually uh, hitting. Uh, let's let, let me just go ahead and step into it, just so we can be certain here. So if we step in, um, and, and we step a while, so we'll see that you know we're at the case where we're six choose three, um, which is going to call these functions, right? Um, and I suppose I'm not going to go ahead and, um, I mean, you know, we could step into here if we wanted to. So now we're in, like, like I said, um, um, oh no, so we ended up in the case of, of the first one here. So we're at five, choose two, right? Um, so I'm going to call again. Um, so we should end up as um, now four choose one, so, so we're going down kind of the, the left side of the tree here. Since you could visualize this as a tree, since there's two um, um, separate calls to the count, you know, recursive calls here. So, um, uh, step over and step in. So we're not we're now at three choose zero, right? So that's one of our base cases. Um, so that'll finally return one, right? Um, and so on. So yeah, I'm, I'm hitting some, we're, we're optimizing some things out. So um, that's that's another thing that I probably should mention, um, or, or we should show that. So if you are running the debugger, you really should run it where we, we turn off um, optimizations, because if you have things optimized, um, that can cause code to not be run, to be optimized out, and, and other things, right? So let's, let's stop the debugger. I'm going to quickly kind of show that. So. Um, so again, when you rebuild um, in the make file, it's using um, dash o2. That's that's doing some optimization. So, so another thing that we might want to do is kind of remove the those flags um, from the make file if we need to run the debugger a lot, so it doesn't optimize that anything out like that. So. So, although, yeah, unfortunately, those flags, you'll have to all, go all the way up to your um, included make file to, to get those. So, those would be up in the uh, top level in these includes. Here's the make file include. Um, and uh, we, we could remove those right here if we wanted to, right? So, that should cause now all my builds to be done without that optimization there like that. So, um, so there you see, we, we got rid of the optimization. So I'll probably make it better for, for debugging with that. So, um, all right. Anyway, the other kind of quick thing I wanted to point out was um, is that um, uh, you are required to write these uh, function documentation. This is the first week I required it. So even though I kind of gave um, an announcement, um, I talked about it both times last week, um, and there were code comments about, you know, don't, don't forget to add in, I don't know if I left it in here, but, but there are code comments about, don't forget to add in your function documentation for the functions when you're building them. Uh, still a few people didn't do that, okay? So, so you are required to do that. Um, um, so let me talk a little bit about those, right? So uh, 
this block of code up at the top, um, some people refer to that as the file header. So this is information about the file in general. Uh, but then also, normally, you know, we want to document um, other pieces of our code. Um, uh, in particular, you usually want to document all of your regular functions and all your member functions of classes. Okay, so um, so um, I'm kind of a big proponent of of I've moved towards you know writing all of your tests before you write a single load of line of code for your function um, and also even writing your documentation for your function before you begin writing your function okay so you guys kind of get a, a taste of having the, the the tests written before you write the code for your function because i give you the unit tests um in, in like you know our assignment for tests as you be so that's kind of one step this is known as test driven development but this other thing is kind of a part of what's known as literate programming so, um, you know, before you write a function, I mean, there's some absolute things that you ought to know about. And I give, again, I give you some of these as part of the assignment when I have a specific function that you're supposed to write or a specific member function. Um, so, I mean, you know, you have to, you want to choose good, meaningful names, right? And, and I usually give you what the actual name should be for the function. Then you have to decide, though, what is the input of the function. So that becomes the parameters. Um, and, and you know what the function returns and then kind of a fourth thing is is how it does that so how it transforms the inputs into the output okay um, so that's part of what a good set of function documents function documentation should provide is, is, is um, describing what the function does, uh, documenting all the input parameters of the function, and documenting the return value if the function is a returning function, if it's, a, if it's not a void function, okay? Now, um, I'm having you guys use what's known as doc oxygen, which is a, a document, you know, a generation system. So it can actually automatically generate code documentation from these kinds of documentation inside your code. I'm going to show that to you um, in, in a second here, right? what I mean by that. So, so in order for, to, for Doc Oxygen to do its work, there's a few special things that you have to use. So first of all, when you have a block comment like this, that's going to be for a, a block of comments for a file header or a block of comments for a function header, it has to start with the two stars. So the, the slash star star um, and in, in with a regular star slash, but that's you know, slash star, star slash would, would define a block comment. So if you use two stars, slash star star, that's an indication to Doc Oxygen that that, um, that that bit of that block comment contains Doc Oxygen uh, formatted um, documentation that it should extract and put into the documentation for the project. Okay. So, um, the format is, I mean, you should have what I call like a short name, which can be like a one, two, three word sort of thing. So this is an example. So this is a function for calculating a factorial, and um, this is an iterative solution, okay? And then you should have one or more lines um, of well-written English sentences, okay? So usually at least one sentence. So simple functions maybe just need a short one sentence description. More complex functions, this can be much bigger. Okay, and, and again, try and you know use well-written English. So so don't um, don't shortcut on this too much. Okay, so one of the powers of of, of documentation like this is um, you know you shouldn't think of writing programs as primarily trying to communicate with your compiler. Okay, because I mean yes, uh, you have to write code that can be compiled so that the compiler can compiled into an executable. But that's really kind of the least, you know, I mean, you should be able to immediately know whether your code is compiling or not when, when you build it, right? So, um, so th that's kind of just a minimal thing. I mean, your code should always be able to, to be compiling and running, right? So a more important aspect of writing code in almost any context nowadays is communicating your intention to other people. Uh, the, the intention of your code okay so that includes i mean maybe other people on your team but also that includes maybe your future self so you know if i go back to this code uh in six months uh, and i need to fix a bug or I need to write 
add some new functionality to it or something. It really helps you to, um, you know, it, it, it really helps you get back into the context of your code if you have well-written documentation, right? Um, that, um, um, so you can refer back to, or that other people that need to work with your code or modify it or understand it can work with it. And me being an evaluator of your code, you know, I really, you know, want you to get into the habit of, of doing these things. You know, so that's part of the purpose of, of you um, communicating your intention of the code you're writing for the assignments to me so I can understand them and evaluate them better. So besides the, the, the short description and basically everything on these lines here that I just highlighted is my short description, right? Then you have to document every parameter. So for these first two functions, there's just one parameter. Now you need to use this at symbol. So this is used by doc oxygen to identify parameter documentation. It has to have the at and then it has to be exactly P-A-R-A-M, not, not parameter. Just parameter. And then the thing after that has to be the, the, the name of the parameter. So it really should match. And, and if it doesn't, I'll show you, you'll get a warning here when you generate your documentation, right? And then again, you should have like a sentence, right? So, you know, for me, this might not be a real great example. So um, um, I, should have, I should have written like a full sentence there maybe. But, uh, and then likewise, if your function returns a value, uh, you use that return tag. I think return or returns both work for doc oxygen. I, I, I prefer just at return. Um, and then again, you know, you need like a sentence, although the, the thing after the return really should be the type. Okay. So, so here you should always get the name of the parameter for, for parameters, but here I mean, you don't have a name for a return thing, but you should identify the type that's being returned by the function and then give a description. Again, it could be one sentence or a couple sentences. Okay? Lines that are more than 80 characters, you should wrap. So the way you wrap around is, is you go to the next line and you have a star. And, and continuations of parameters, you should invent them by like two spaces, well, three spaces, depending on like how you count it. Two, two spaces from, you know, so, so it shouldn't be exactly underneath there. There should be some indentation. Two spaces would be best to look at. Um, so notice, um, so if, if you have more than one parameter, if you have two parameters, then you have you need two of these at parameters, right? And if you have more than one line, they, they, they wrap around um, and they're all indented and lined up there, okay? Um, if you don't have any parameters, you don't need any at param tags, so, so you certainly can have functions that don't have any input. Likewise, if, if your function is a void function, if it doesn't return anything, uh, you don't really need the at return tag. So these, these can be left out if you're not returning a value or if, if you don't have any parameters or both. Okay. But I mean, you should always have though a um, short description and a sentence or more longer description of your function here. Okay. Um, now, if you have that documentation in there, um, uh, let me show you, I mean, you know, this is part, we, we don't really use it uh, for the assignments here is to, to demonstrate kind of using some of these kinds of development tools um, in our class dev box. Um, but there's a target called make docs and this will run the doc oxygen to extract um, that kind of code documentation into, um, um, into HTML documentation and into PDF documentation. So we do a make docs. You'll see it should say it's generating the doc action documentation. If you're missing some things, you'll get some warning messages out here, okay? Um, and what you should notice, I mean, if, if you were if you were sharp eyed, you'll see that that um, uh, these two um, directories were created um, when I did the make docs there. Okay, so one of them holds um, a, you know HTML based version of the documentation, and one holds um, a PDF version of the documentation. That's in the LaTeX. On here. So then let me just show the HTML. So if you go into here, um, probably you want to op open up the index. So that'll start you at the top level. So let's just, we'll just open it up in, in a regular file browser, right? Um, so I guess you probably have to maybe look at your file list. Um, so if you bring up your file list, you should see all the files that are in the project. Um, 
including like the binomial function studies PP. So notice, um, so I'll just point out some things. Um, so the, the description here is pulled out from the file documentation, right? So all this information comes, um, switch back and forth, comes from the information you have at the top of the file. In this case, I'm looking at the .hpp file. So it's pulling this information, uh, the author, the file, brief description, and the long description um, from here. So that's the brief description, and that's the long description there. And the author, and the date, and then all the, the stuff that was notes appears under this note here. Okay? And then notice, even though we didn't have function documentation um, um, in the header file, we only, so one other thing about that, so some people, well, I think only one person did, but they put, they actually copied, so you had both documentation before the function prototypes and the same documentation over in the implementation file. You, you, you don't want to do that. So for one thing, to have two copies of anything means that, um, you know, if you change it in one place, you have to make certain that it's changed in both places. That's bad. So you never want to repeat yourself. Um, and by convention, we usually put the, the documentation into the implementation file, the .cpp file, right? So you should just have the prototypes over here um, and the full documentation of the function goes over the .cpp file. So um, notice, um, yeah, there's the slash star star is one thing that DocDocusin uses to identify code blocks. Uh, another thing you can also use three slashes. So three slashes is another indication to Doc Oxygen that there's some code documentation to pull off. So here we did document this type def um, so that this documentation um, we see in the header file here. So this, so this documentation for the type def um, is coming from, from that. And then these documentation for um, the, the functions is coming from the, 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 the function documentation um, in the implementation file, right? So, so again, you know, it pulled out this as the short description. So you should see, um, actually, I guess it just trams together the short description. Uh, so, so that was the short description on the very first line. And this was all the rest of the lines for the longer description. Um, I thought it, I thought it did something a little bit special with the short description. Maybe I have to set a parameter or something for that. So, um, and then you know, at all at param tags come out um, under the parameters for the function documentation, and and again, you know, the, the first thing should be the name of the parameter, so it, it pulls that out correctly, um, and then your return tag is pulled out for the return value. Okay. Um, so anyway, I, I mean, you know, you can look at that um, um, and look through the documentation. So, you know, the, the, the documentation for the header and the implementation file will be pretty similar. The other thing is you get the actual um, description of the .cpp file down here, but, um, um, uh, but, but it will, I mean, the way doc oxygen works, it, it does put the documentation for the function. Um, uh, it puts it both, you know, for the header and the implementation file, even though you've only got it in one place. So, um, I don't know exactly what ends up in like our tests, um, but um, yeah, so it does uh, consider it all those test cases as functions um, that pulls off the file header and other stuff. So. Um, okay. So kind of just as a final thing on that. So one thing I do run on your reports to make certain that you've got all the required documentation is um, I do do that make docs and get the report uh, of running that. So for example, if you're missing the documentation for a whole function, um, you do the make docs, um, you'll get warnings about um, um, the, the, the function is not documented, okay? Or, I mean, if you miss, if you have the documentation, but you're missing, um, you know, like, like the, a parameter or something, um, that'll warn you about that as well. So I put that back. Uh, uh, but let's say you forgot to document the parameter. Um, it'll give you a, you know, a message about parameters of that member 
a function or not all documents, right? And that, I think it'll do that if you don't quite get the format right. So for example, um, you know, so if you use the wrong name, so the, the name of the parameter should match the, the name given in the function signature, right? If you give the wrong name, um, yeah, so it gives you a warning about the wrong name is not found in the argument list. So, so yeah, those do need to match in order to, to get doc oxygen to correctly generate the function documentation. So, all right. So yeah, you might want to to um, I should maybe add that as part of the submission process that it actually runs the doc, so you can also see um, if um, you're missing any of the required documentation or not for your functions. All right, so that was the um, kind of all the things I think that I had to say about assignment before. Um, you know, I think most everybody um, was getting recursion well enough from, from, from the submissions that I got. Okay, so you, even the people that, that didn't write a recursive implementation of one of the functions usually um, had written a recursive implementation of, of at least one, you know, but maybe they didn't do it for both, but at least one, which, you know, which hopefully means to me that, that, that you could understand the recursion uh, at, at a basic level, um, although, you know, the, the recursive um, combinations recursive was, was a little bit more tricky, right? So it was a, it was a more complex um, general case, a recursive case where you had to make two calls um, recursively to the function. So. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and um, close out assignment four here. Um, and let's 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 kind of make a start on, on assignment uh, next assignment assignment five okay so um, and, and I'm just going to get started on here and discuss a little bit and we can discuss more on Wednesday hopefully people will have some questions um, we'll talk about the assignment so in this assignment um, you're going to be implementing um, a quick sort. Um, Um, oh, I'm sorry, no. Um, so this week we're doing the um, um, implementing some um, uh, search. So we're, so we're going to be implementing uh, a binary search using recursion. Okay. So let's look at the assignment task. So ne next week you'll be doing the quick sort. Um, so Oh yeah, so I, I did ask you to write um, a recursive version of a, of a basic sequential search um, and then a recursive version of, um, of, of a of a binary search, right? So, so yeah, you, you basically just got two functions um, this week here, right? So um, so for this, the sequential search, um, you have to change the, um, so, so looking at the code might, might uh, make it clear, but you have to change the signature a little bit. So, so normally when, when we looked at the sequential search in our textbook, um, you basically just gave it the, the array and the size of the array. Okay. So to turn it into a recursive version, we want to uh, give like the begin and end location in the array, both for the sequential search and the binary search, right? So, so we change the signature a little bit um, so that like on a recursive call, we can um, reduce what is the uns unsearched portion of the list um, a little bit by changing the begin or the end bounds that we're searching within, okay? So, um, oops. 
close that. So as usual, let's look at our tiles. The first, um, the first task I, I ask you to um, basically do the um, uh, sequential search here. So um, you can get an idea, more specifically, an idea of the um, signature, right? So here, um, uh, so we are actually in the test. We're, we're searching with a list of strings. So I ask you to take um, an array of strings. Right. Um, so, so we passed in the array and we passed in the begin and the end index inclusive. Okay. So if we have an array of size 10, the valid indexes are, are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Right. So that's why we pass in 0 and size minus 1. So we're saying the unsearched portion for the sequential searches starts at index 0 and ends at index 9. And we want to search, so you need a fourth keyword, we want to search for, see if this item is in the, uh, the list, right? And, and what sequential search does, and, and this is the same as your textbook now, um, is, is it returns an, uh, an integer. So it returns an, uh, the index if it finds it. So in this case, Jane is not in the list. So we're expecting, though, um, for a, a failed search, um, we define a... Um, a special flag, which is probably defined as negative one. So you can find that probably in the assignment five search um, header file. All right, so let's, let's look at that. So right, we, we define that constant for you in the not find. So again, this, this is another example of using code that's more readable, that, that, that communicates your intention better. Right. So if you just said equal minus one, that's less clear. Um, uh, you know what, what is really that flag is being used is to indicate an unsuccessful search or that the, you know, the value was not found um, in the list here. Right. So um, anyway, so your first step, um, as usual, I'll kind of show it to you or give it to you. Um, you should define a stub function of, of your for your, of, of this first function, sequential search. Um, and in this case, and so that we, we give you the name, we, we kind of know that the, these are, it, it takes four parameters um, and it's returning an integer as the result. Um, as I, as I kind of described a little bit to you. So, um, so we could start by, so, so we know that um, we get, a list of strings um, so this might not be the greatest names but um, um, we, we get a begin index and an end index so like it could maybe even be more explicit say begin index and end index. and then we get a search string here so um, call it search value, a little bit more generic, All right? And this is a function prototype. And, you know, finally, this returns um, an integer, right, which is the, the result, um, the index um, for the value. Um, if we find it, the index where we, where we found it in the uh, list that we're searching, or this not found flag if we don't find it, right? Um, so just adding the prototype um, isn't enough to, it should be enough to get the test to compile because, because now we've said, okay, there is going to be some function somewhere with that signature and, and you know, it's the way we're calling it in the test matches the signature that we just um, created. So that should make, as far as compiling the, the assignment file, test a CPP to an object file, um, um, you should be able to succeed doing that. But since we haven't implemented anything, when it, when it comes down here and tries to link them together, um, we will get um, an error message. Um, um, and it should be basically telling us um, undefined reference, right? 
because it was expecting somebody to implement that and we haven't implemented that function yet anywhere. So, so um, and then kind of as a first step though, you should go ahead and add in um, a stub implementation. So we'll need to put that into our um, implementation file. Go ahead and and like I usually like to do is I, I do like to copy the um, the prototype we might, we might want to start by just returning not found um, initially right? Now that should compile and run. And I would encourage you to, to do the function documentation at this point as well, but let, let's see if that compiles. So that should compile. So now if I rebuild, it only should have to rebuild the assignment file search. That should be successful um, in compiling it now, right? Um, as it was. And then we should be able to run the test now. Um, although they'll be failing. So um, those were always, well, it, it'll, so the first failing one is 48, right? Because um, we were expecting that file for these first two um, ones, but, but yeah, when, when we expect it to actually find something and return a valid index, you know, Badger is a two here, uh, index two in the array, um, it fails. Okay. Um, and then here, you know, as, as I was saying, you know, I, I would encourage you to, uh, before continuing on, To write your documentation. So right now we're going to get um, a message from Doc Oxygen that um, the sequential search recursive is not documented. Right. I usually just um, create my little header here, um, you know, with the two stars, right, and then all these stars should be lined up underneath um, the first one here. So a short description and then a longer description so um, you want to search the indicated list of strings for um, a particular value um, we are given the begin in index of the unsearched portion of the list. Um, so and if we find the item being searched for, uh, we we'll return the index in the list where the item resides. Otherwise, we return a um, special flag right, indicating a failed search. All right. Uh, maybe I mean you know maybe you don't have to be quite that verbose on, on this uh, pretty simple function, but but that's kind of an, in, uh, uh, an example right, of writing a couple sentence description. Now, now then we have to document all the parameters. So we've got. Um, Parameter called list, parameter called begin index, and a parameter called um, search value, right? And this is a value returning function, so uh, it returns an int, right? And again, you should have you know, a little description on each of these. So, you know, so we're going to strings we search. I don't know why the color coding lost there. Anyway, um, so this is the beginning index of the unsearched. Portion of the array. This is the ending in 
going back to the unsearched portion. Less, I should say less, because we called it less. And this is the string value we are to search for. Uh, yes. right. And it returns um, the um, index of the value searched for the list if found uh, two spaces um, otherwise if search fails returns not found for that right something like that so that's kind of what I'm looking for for the function that I contain so again this is just um, you know, even before we write the function, this is making it clear in our mind kind of what it's supposed to do, what it's taking uh, as input to the function, um, what it's supposed to be returning here, and so on, all right? So if we make our docs, that should um, have no warnings if I didn't mistype something. So like, um, Mistyped param, that's why it wasn't color coded. So, uh, Visual Studio Code actually um, by default has um, some color code parsing of block comments um, that's kind of doc oxygen aware. So, yeah, it's seeing those params and then the names of parameters. So, so yeah, that's why that wasn't color coded there. There we go. So, that's better. So, so anyway, now we've got that function fully documented. So. Um, but I didn't add any code, so uh, by I did add some comments, and I had to recompile the um, that file and then relink them together. So. All right, um, so that's you know basically a start, and then so to make this a recursive version, um, as I described, what you should do is. Um, if the, so, your base case should be if, if the very first item in the list. I think I think I said, the, you know, check the first item. So if the very first item in the list, so that'd be the, the item at begin index. If that's the one you're searching for, then return the, that that index where you just found it, right? So if, so it happens to be like um, um, so initially when, if we search for Walter down here, and then maybe I should have made that the very first one so we could check. Um, um, uh, base cases there pretty well, but um, uh, but yeah. So so you know if, if we search and then we turn, we initially call it where the begin index is zero, and if we find it at begin at whatever the begin index is, um, then we should just return that index that we found. Otherwise, the recursive case is to call sequential search recursive again, but we we just check that it wasn't you know from that base case we just checked that it wasn't in the very first value, so we want to search from begin index plus one. To um, in index, okay. Um, oh, another thing. Um, yeah, it's, uh, let me check the assignment description. But I think that that's um, probably how I described. You should implement it there. So. So oh, and I have kind of a description of the binary search as well. But again, if you did the readings or watch the, the, the textbook, uh, watch the lecture videos, um, you should have seen that um, you know we we had we talked about the sequential version of binary search. So so the recursive version again is going to be similar, uh, but um, uh, we changed the, the signature a little bit. So like we just did for the sequential search, uh, the binary search is going to have the same signature. So you have a list and you begin and end items. And the item that you want to search for. So, so yeah, um, I kind of already gave you the base case also in the assignment description. So if, if you search for the begin item as a search item, then you can just return it. Um, uh, oh, yeah, the, but you do have to be careful. So you should have another, you have to watch out for a runaway recursion, right? So if you ever get to the point where there's nothing left to search, so if begin is equal to end, then you've kind of gone all the way down to the, the end of the list. So you've recursively called yourself um, and searched all uh, down to the last item. But if you call yourself one more time and add one to begin, 
and call yourself recursively, then begin is going to be greater than the end, but there's nothing left to search. So, so yeah, you actually have two base cases um, in this one. All right. Okay, so I think that's enough hints to get going. And, and yeah, I don't know if I'm going to write any more code um, on Wednesday. So we'll see. But if, 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 if people have questions, especially like maybe about the binary search, so the binary search is, is a little bit more complicated, um, of course, to implement than the uh, in the recursive version than the um, uh, sequential search is. Um, all right, um, I think that um, I'm going to go ahead and stop the video there for today. Then um, uh, the session for today, as usual, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, otherwise, I will see you guys again on Wednesday.